Okay. Okay, so um, hello again, everybody. Today I'm speaking again to Thomas. It's my second day here, and today I had a uh, we had more of a technical conversation, and this will be the purpose of this one. So I think I'm going to start here again, Thomas, but maybe just giving us an explanation of what is the story result from, from the agriculture process. Yeah. So, well, so like, do you want to know about how the salt is made? Yeah. Or let's, let's start with the salt. So why why did you target thorium and uh, uh, for your react in particular. Yeah, yes. So, yeah, you can basically use uh, uranium and thorium and to some extent plutonium as nuclear fuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is lots of thorium on this planet, but the problem with thorium is that you need a kickstart fuel to get it going. Yeah. There's very, very little plutonium on this planet and it's difficult to get your hands on it. So it is being used a little bit today in nuclear reactors, uh, but it's sort of not the primary fuel. The primary fuel today is uranium and especially enriched uranium. That is what is used in most reactors. And uh, and mo well, I think almost all reactors in the world are thermal reactors. That means they they operate in the thermal spectrum or with what is called slow neutrons. Uh, and um, and you can never make a breather reactor with uranium and thermal spectrum. So that's another reason why we wanted to use thorium because. With thorium and thermal spectrum, you can make a breeder reactor and and therefore you can end up in a situation where you need a lot less fuel. All the existing reactors, they need refueling sort of every two years, some of them even more than every two years. And of course, that's very expensive with doing all that mining and fuel production and it generates a lot of waste. And I mean, it's just one of the things that makes the nuclear industry in effect, uh, inefficient. Um, so we, we really wanted to, to get to a type of reactor that is can produce energy at much lower cost and solve some of the issues. And thorium is sort of for us the key to do that because the thorium we can make a breeder and once we can make a breeder then the price of energy goes down by uh, yeah, a factor of one or two uh, compared to enriched uranium and, um, and there's lots of thorium. So, so that, that, as you explained to me earlier, was your end goal, is to get eventually to the fact that you, you've got the breeder reactor. But to get there, you, you took an interesting process. You're doing it in baby steps, in an iterative process steps. Can you maybe just explain to people, like, what is your design philosophy here and how, how that process works? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, when we started as a company, we didn't have a lot of money. We're in a country that had, doesn't have nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Denmark doesn't have commercial nuclear power plants. We, we used to have three research reactors, but they've all been closed down now. And the people who ran those are old and not really active anymore. And so we don't have a government um, regulator that could even give us an approval to run a nuclear reactor. So, so we knew from the beginning, okay. And I mean, one more reason also that one of our co-founders came from the molten salt industry. He had been doing his PhD in molten salt and and we have a part of the technical university here has a lot, many decades of experience in using molten salts for other uh, commercial industries um, and material science. So, I mean, it was, it was very natural for us to start building stuff and learning about the molten salt issues and figuring out the corrosion and these other things. And of course, from very early on, we started doing simulations and we realized that you cannot make a breeder reactor in thermal spectrum except if you remove the fission products. Right. And all the reactors in the world that has ever been running kept the fission products in the solid fuel rods. So we have never removed the fission products online while the reactor was running in any of the reactors. So we knew that this is something new. This is something where we have to, uh, first of all, we have to develop the technology to do that online removal of fission products that are highly radioactive. Like, it's not like when you get natural uranium or thorium, I mean, you could hold it in your hand, you can eat it, it's not that radioactive. But fission products that has just been created from fission, they are extremely radioactive. So you have to make some kind of machine that can remove those while they are crazy radioactive. And we knew that, one, it had never been done before, two, it would be super difficult to get it approved. Three, you know, it'll probably take many years for us to develop the techniques to do that. So, so we started looking at, you know, what are the sort of the 
easy things to remove and what are the very difficult things to remove and of course we start with the easy things. Uh, the, there was the molten reactor experiments in the 1960s that ran in Oak Ridge and that one actually removed xenon and krypton. Right. Uh, so you could say that was sort of fission product removal but they didn't do it in a very efficient way. Uh, we've already looked at different ways to do it so that you get a higher percentage of those uh, volatile fission products out. Once you get volatile fission products out, there's actually some of the fluorine species, that means molecules of fluorine and some metal that is, uh, has a high vapor pressure, or has a high probability of getting out of the salt at these temperatures, six, 700 degrees. Mm -hmm. So of course we also want to get those out, and we, but we don't want those to clock in filters and other things. The thing when you remove highly radioactive fission products, even though they are gases when you remove them, one second later they might decay to something else and become solid. So you have to manage the thing, this thing where you remove something that is a gas and a little bit later it's a solid thing inside your canister or whatever where you hold your gas. And in there it gives off a lot of heat because radioactive things have decay heat. So you have to cool that whatever tank and you have to manage that. But that's another problem of course we have to solve. And then like I told you also earlier that we are already removing some of the metal impurities from the salt and in a real reactor those would also be fission products. So we already have the capability of removing some of the fission products from the salt from like chemical methods. Um, uh, but there's still another, at least 30% of the fission products are super difficult to remove mm -hmm. and there we still do not have enough experience. And I also showed you how we have these test loops yes. where we can develop and test the technology on stable versions of the fission products. So we don't, we don't need to have the highly radioactive. We can put small amounts like PPM levels of different fission products in the salt and then we can remove it again in these pump systems that we are running for thousands of hours and we can see that these fission products removal systems are stable over time, over you know thousands of hours or over years. Because before you get approval from a, from the authorities to put it inside a real commercial reactor, you you must have proven first that it's it's working outside. And right. you, of course, you want to start with non-radioactive fission products. Yeah. So the what, what, what struck me is these two things: is uh, first of all, you've got the um, the different tests. So you have a maybe you should first elaborate on that. You have a mis, uh, testing equipment that only tests the material in the heat to get the material properties right. Yeah. And then you have one that tests the pump feeder configuration, dynamic testing, if you will, in the flow. And then you have the uh, water test, and then you go into salt test, and then you go into um, uh, to, to, to radioactive testing, right? Yeah. So maybe just expand a little bit on like why do you choose this philosophy of, of testing? Yeah. Uh, well, so we are four founders who started the company, and two of us have built other companies before. And we have learned the uh, hard way or the painful way that when, when, you, when you develop products, uh, you will make a lot of failures and you will encounter things that could be improved or made in a different way. And so, so when you develop products, any product, there's iterations, you, you sort of improve it one iteration at a time. And, and for our company now, many, many of the products you saw out there, whether it's pumps or sensors or electronics or valves, Many of those components have already been through 10 iterations by now. Even the loops, the big loops we looked at for testing components, uh, they have been through 10 iterations. Uh, and, and of course, in the future, we're going to continue to make iterations. So we knew that even before we started the company. And, and I think that's one of the things where we are different than the rest of the nuclear industry. There's a lot of nuclear engineers that uh, have this other philosophy where you, just do, you do a paper design, and then you, you, you make like a huge paper design and you take that to the regulator and you ask the regulator, you know, can this get approved and can I, you know, please get the money to build an entire nuclear power plant. Uh, and that's not an iterative process. And therefore, when you don't have these iterations, then you have to have a much higher certainty that whatever you design will work. And, and when you're not sort of testing it before you build it, uh, I mean, the, the, the you have much less uh, uh, room to play with the different uh, ideas and variations and 
like figure out what should the material thickness be or mm -hmm. uh, so they have to have a much bigger safety margin or um, and, and sometimes they design things that are maybe not the best way because you know it's difficult to sit there in your office and think like exactly how everything is going to work uh, well, we are not able to do that here in our company so anyway so we, we took that approach with iterative testing and first we test in non-radioactive things and then later on we test with radioactive things because it's it's much more expensive to do the exact same test but with radioactive materials because uh, mm -hmm. you need approvals you need to train the, uh, the, the 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 staff and you need to make sure you generate no waste at all and i have to admit early on when we just testing and uh, you saw some of the components that were corroded yes. uh, early on we had lots of failures lots of things that we had to send to trash and you don't want to do that when they have been wetted in radioactive salts. Once you have stuff that have been used with radioactive salt, you, you want to create as little waste as possible uh, because, it's because yeah, it's expensive, but also the authorities require that of you. And if you, if you don't have a design with small amount of waste, then they ask you to redesign it basically. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why we do all the testing on non radioactive things first. So we know that. We basically know it works before we move on to the to the radioactive yes. test. I, I mean, what, what, what struck me is, I mean, your, the gaskets that you have, the welding, you know, so you're actually trying, if you just elaborate a little on this, different techniques as well, mm. within your connections, for example, and things like that. Yeah. And your metal handling, your salt handling, those are mm. very you know, critical points. Yeah. yeah. Um, on, on the molten salt, uh, on this, you know, so I'm talking now about salt that is not radioactive. You got to explain that salt and how that process works as well. Mm. Yeah, so, so uh, there are many, many different types of molten salt reactors, but you could sort of, if you want to make a rough classification, you can say that either they are fluoride salts uh, mm -hmm. or they are chloride salts. Right. And typically, chloride salts would be fast reactors, fast molten salt reactors, and fluoride salt would be thermal or slow neutron mm -hmm. of molten salt reactors. So for us, we want to make a thorium. Uh, reactor in thermal spectrum with slow neutrons and a moderator we use heavy water as a moderator so we would use fluoride salts and we looked at all the different fluoride salts you can make and there's one called phenac which is a mix of lithium sodium and potassium mm -hmm. and then fluorine um, that is fairly low cost but has very similar melting points and density and uh, viscosity and other properties Properties are very similar to the real uh, uranium and thorium salts, so that's why we use that salt because it's low price. Uh, we can have students work with it. Uh, I told you out there in the production that I mean it's it's not super toxic. You can eat sort of one gram of it before you die. Of right. course, you, you should be careful, and we do train our employees and students and everything mm -hmm. how to handle these. But it's not. I mean, it's not dangerous if you get it on the skin. It you shouldn't do that, but. It's only dangerous if you start ingesting it. Right. Um, whereas when you start working with with uranium and thorium salts, the the level of uh, safety and requirements just go up by a factor of ten. Um, so that's why we use uh, Fleenac as the main testing salt. There's another salt that some of the other companies are using. It's called Fly. Yeah. So it's it's a very similar salt, but it has beryllium, and beryllium is super toxic. So it, it it's just by touching your skin, it's dangerous, and you can definitely not eat one gram of it, or not even half a gram. Like it, beryllium is much, much more toxic. So, so that's why we don't use beryllium or yeah. fly salt. It's because we can't have students work with that. And a lot of times, when you work with fly salt, you need always to have two barriers between the worker and the salt, and that just makes things more complicated. Okay. And um, the other thing that you showed me is um, the, the, the salt process as well. And um, maybe elaborate as well, why is the cleanliness, the, the, yeah, the cleanliness or the purity of the salt so important for this process? Yeah, so, so uh, you know that salt water and your car, steel, regular steel and salt water is corrosive. Uh, that's also why we don't have steel pipes in buildings. We have, mm -hmm. or nowadays, we have either copper pipes or, or uh, stainless steel pipes or, or plastic in many countries. Um, but uh, yeah, any, any salt uh, and moisture and oxygen 
creates corrosion. Yeah. And when you when you increase the temperature of you know any metal, you get more corrosion. You get more of this corrosive process. So so we really have to sort of understand at high temperatures corrosion goes really really fast, and especially with this fluoride salts or chloride salts, it's mm -hmm. it's a very corrosive at high temperatures. But what really reduces the corrosion is if you can remove all oxygen. And of course, oxygen is also part of moisture because moisture is water, hydrogen, and oxygen. So, you know, the more oxygen you can remove from the system, the less corrosion you have. Mm -hmm. And if, if, you, if you somehow cannot remove the oxygen from your salt, then you have to buy more expensive materials. I gave an example that we are using stainless steel. Yes. We could have used Inconel or Hestloy or some of these other expensive steels. Just Inconel is 10 times more expensive than stainless steel. So, so it's a trade-off. Either you spend a lot of money on cleaning the salt or you spend a lot of money on the buying more expensive steel. Uh, you will still have corrosion in Inconel, but of course you have less corrosion in Inconel than you have in stainless steel. So, so, the, so the strategy has been to purify the salt, spend a lot of focus on that, and then keep the materials as standard or as, yeah. as yes. productive as production based as possible, right? Mm. And with the salt, you've already signed up on clients, right? They're mm. really selling it. Yes. Yeah, and, and one of the features in doing this cleaning, it's not only moisture and oxygen we remove, we also remove other impurities, yes. like uh, different metals, chrome and uh, yeah, um, iron and other things. And learning how to remove those is exactly the same we need when we remove fishing products from the salt later on mm. inside the reactor. So, I mean, it's sort of a, we, we thought we had to do this anyway, eventually, so why not start as early as possible? Uh, and then the, the other um, process we'd like you to elaborate on is the difference between beryllium-6 and your attempt to make in beryllium, lithium-6 and 7. Yeah. And why lithium-7 is so, um, why lithium seven is so um, important and, and maybe also just explain the geopolitics around that mineral. Yeah, yes. So, uh, when you make, once you have made the decision that you want to build a molten salt reactor, uh, then you look at all the different materials you can use for making salts mm -hmm. and uh, different companies use different materials. There's uh, uh, circular or a uh, zircon, there's uh, sodium, there's potassium is not really good because potassium has a high capture cross section so it will capture too many neutrons. There's lithium, problem with lithium, when you take lithium out of the ground it has two isotopes, lithium-7 and lithium-6. Uh, lithium-6 has a very high capture cross-section, so lithium-6 is really bad, <laughs> but lithium-7 is really great. It has a very, very low cap capture cross-section, and also because lithium is a light element, it has a little bit of uh, uh, thermalization, of, uh, or it's a little bit of a moderator, so that, that helps. So, so basically, you can, look, you can use lithium or you can use beryllium. Beryllium also has a small capture cross-section but lithium is much cheaper than beryllium. So, um, so that there's all these different trade-offs. And also when you mix these salts, uh, you have to look at the sort of how much uh, thorium and uranium that can get uh, dissolved in the salt. I just need a little, little bit more. Yeah. Mm. And you also need to look at the melting point. So there's all kinds of different uh, things you, you want to take into consideration when you select the salt. I already mentioned that there's a number of other companies who've decided to use a, a salt called Fly. Yes. It also has lithium, and they also need lithium enrichment if they want a high uh, um, neutron economy in their reactor design. Uh, and so we knew from them really early on that we we didn't want to use beryllium and Fly. We wanted to use just very standard salt called lithium fluoride, thorium fluoride, mm. and it has a lot of lithium in there. So then it becomes even more important to have pure lithium uh, seven. And you can buy lithium seven from China or Russia. Uh, supposedly there's also other countries like US that are making it, but there you are not allowed to buy it. Maybe some national lab has it, but they don't even, we don't even know which national lab. So, um, and we didn't want to, build a company that was reliant on either Russia or China as a supplier. And also, we would like to have higher enrichment 
quality than what is currently available from Russia or China. So of course we can try to convince them to make high quality for us, but we decided many years ago that Comeg Atomics wanted to have our own enrichment facility, and we have taken several patents on that, right. and we have developed the process. It's not it's not yet ready to scale up, but my hope is that later this year we can actually show the world samples with very high. I, I told you uh, our target is five nines, so ninety nine point nine 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 percent. Uh, enriched lithium seven. So, so, and I hope we can achieve that before Christmas th this year. So that's a that's a, one of the big milestones for us. But of course, it's a very technical milestone. Most people in the general public don't understand well, why is that important. But it's super important yeah, for us. For the and and um, and even before we start selling reactors, I'm pretty sure we can start selling lithium seven because lots of other companies in the nuclear industry also needs that and. Once you make lithium seven, you also make make lithium six, mm -hmm. and there's companies, the fusion companies need lithium six, so there's also customers for that side. Oh, so you I mean, this is also something that struck me is that mm -hmm. you you actually spend a lot of time to get the one process perfect with your iterations, your learning curves, and then mm -hmm. you've got a product ready. Yeah, I mean that sort of helps to mess up the process. Yeah. Going. it's a very very clever way. The, the, the pump is another example. Uh, yeah. the, the pump is made for for us because we needed a pump for molten salts. But of course, it can also be used in other industries. Yeah, yeah. the the the, the salt pump. Um, the other question I had for you is on the heavy water um, as a moderator, the thorium. Yeah. Um, why why did you choose the thorium? Uh, yeah. So so we we have to choose between. There's only really two good moderators. It's heavy water or deuterium or graphite. Yes, and we had to choose between the two of them. And we also saw that most of the other companies that are doing uh, molten reactors, they are looking towards uh, graphite. Uh, but the problem with graphite is that it has a limited lifespan in yes. a reactor. Uh, some people talk about four years, other people think that maybe they can make it work for seven years. Uh, I think there's even one company talking about 12 years. But, uh, you know, it, it's questionable how many years can you actually run a reactor with a high neutron flux mm -hmm. in graphite. And that has to be proven first. And then after they've proven that, then they also have to show, you know, you know, after they replace it, they have to re like replace it every four years or seven years or whatever. And then they have a lot of waste. How can they manage that? How can they turn that graphite into something that is not radioactive waste? It's not impossible, but of course it costs money. Uh, whereas if you use heavy water, heavy water does not degrade, so you can use it for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. And you don't have waste afterwards. It's not radioactive, so you can actually sell it to somebody else afterwards. And I think heavy water will always have a, a high a high price. So it be, it becomes instead of have instead of being something you use up all the time and you generate waste, it becomes something you just it just needs to be. It's an upfront cost, but then it's there for a hundred years, and and then even after the hundred years, it has a value. Uh, so that's why we we used heavy water. Also, there's other things. Heavy water, you can you can drain it out of the core. That's uh, impressive safety. Yeah, so it's it's a safety feature, and also you can adjust the water height, and this gives you a much bigger range of burnout. So you can you can start. You, you know, with the solid fuel reactors, we use control rods, yes. and control rods capture a lot of neutrons. Which, if you want to make a breeder in thermal spectrum, it's absolutely impossible if you have all these control rods that capture all the neutrons. But with heavy water, you can start with a low uh, water level, and then over years, when you burn up your fuel and you need sort of a little bit more uh, moderation, you can increase your water level slowly, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And this gives you a very, very long burn up with the same fuel. So this means we don't need online refueling. And this is another problem in the molten salt reactor industry, sort of, you know, some of the other companies, they want to do online refueling while the reactor is running, it's not impossible, but of course that is extra difficulty in in the regulation, the regulatory process or the approval process. Uh, so you, you've already thought of the regulatory process, obviously before you did your design. There was issues when you well, we, we had we just discussed all these things for many years. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the other question is, I saw a lot of bottles of nitrogen and argon. Yeah. What do you use them for? 
Yeah, so mainly we use argon as a cover gas for the salt. So again, we back to the problem with the corrosion. You cannot have moisture and oxygen, and regular air is full of moisture and oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, so we mainly use argon as a cover gas for the salts. Yes. But then we also have we have secondary containments where we don't have salts, but we we also want to have uh, inert gases uh, that do not attack or create corrosion in the secondary containments and those are usually nitrogen and so we use nitrogen especially in the reactor because it's really big and nitrogen is less expensive than argon but also we will soon start to use it in the test loops mm -hmm. uh, as the secondary uh, inert gas one other option is if there are leaks now we can start to detect if argon goes from the first barrier into the second barrier uh, or through the first barrier then then we can detect how if there is a leak. Um, but the uh, other question is to move on from the chemistry to the heat exchange that you had. I mean, we started here when you go into the entrance, there's always this big heat exchange that comes from the um, desalination process. Yeah. Right? So can you maybe explain the link between the desalination and why that heat exchange is so important? Yeah. So, so um, uh, yeah, so really early on, we we wanted to have a, a very compact heat exchanger mm -hmm. and we looked at all the different manufacturers of heat exchangers in the world that works at high temperature. Obviously, you, you cannot have heat exchangers with gaskets. That If you look at all the entire market for heat exchangers, like more than half of them use rubber gaskets. And so they are out of the question. <laughs> and then you are back to something that is made out of steel, welded or some yes. other way. Uh, and there's a number of different heat exchangers. The, the most used one is called tube and shell heat exchangers. They are used in power plants all over the world today, but but they take a lot of salt volume in them, mm -hmm. and uh, salt with lithium seven and uh, enriched uranium or plutonium. In the beginning, we mainly designed for plutonium, so, so just the holdup of lithium seven and plutonium in the heat exchanger was you know a hundred times more expensive than the heat exchanger itself. So it was obvious that you know, shell and tube was not the optimal choice for us because our salt is so expensive. So we had to make a heat exchanger that was smaller and the the plates heat exchanger is the obvious choice. Uh, and there's only a few companies in the world that make plate heat exchangers that are made entirely out of stainless steel. And one of them was sort of right, a, uh, right across the water here in Copenhagen called Alpha Laval. Yes. Uh, they are a really, really big international company making many heat exchangers for industrial use. I actually think they're number one in the world for making industrial heat exchangers. And that same company also make, make desalination equipment for, especially for ships. Uh, so if you have ever been on a cruise ship or something and you drink water, that water is highly likely made somewhere deep in the ship from a Alpha Laval desalination unit. So they take seawater in and, and, and use the waste heat from the diesel engine to create all the water for shower and drinking on the ship. And it's, it's, it's very pure water, like much more pure than the stuff you get in your regular tap, uh, tap water. Right. Um, yeah, um, the other question is here, the, um, this reactor of yours, okay, it's one megawatt, right? It was going to be one megawatt, the large reactor that you're building over here. Um, and then it's gonna go onto a, a container. And uh, can maybe just explain to them the various levels of barriers, the defensive depth that is within that container. Yes, yes. So, so the first barrier is the one that is all the pipes and tanks mm -hmm. and heat exchangers and valves and so uh, there's no valves but there's um, yeah heat exchangers valves so heat exchangers uh, pipes uh, tanks pumps and then the reactor core those are the main components um, and uh, that is the first barrier it's all made out of stainless steel. Ah, the reactor core we maybe need to make make more expensive materials, but but outside the the heat exchanger and the pump and so on is made out of stainless steel. That is the first barrier, which is it's not supposed to leak. Mm -hmm. But we can get back to like how big a leak could we tolerate if if there was a problem. Then the second barrier is the reactor container, which is is a big box out of steel, roughly the same footprint as a forty foot shipping container. Uh, the wall thickness is eight millimeter steel, so it's it's quite heavy mm -hmm. and it's completely gas tight. And when it's built on the assembly line, 
it, it's everything is put in there and it's welded shut and it never gets opened. So we never do any service inside that reactor ever again. Um, and then once it gets to the site where it's supposed to produce energy, uh, the salts are loaded, salt and heavy water are loaded through um, pipes that go into the system. Uh, and then the third barrier outside all of that uh, is what we call a cocoon. It's basically a, a really big uh, steel structure with like half a meter thick steel walls, which can take air, air, air pack, uh, or sorry, aircraft impact and, and uh, several bar, I think it's more than 10 bars of pressure inside. And it's, it, we're not, usually we don't have pressure inside, but if something happens, it can take a lot of pressure and it also has a sort of built in, um, um, what's called a, uh, ah, I forgot the name, um, condenser, yeah. so that because we have heavy water, uh, if there was a fire or explosion or something, we could potentially generate steam. But then this whole cocoon has a condenser, and because there's so much steel there, it has a huge uh, thermal heat capacity. So you can you could easily condense all the heavy water just with the heat capacity in the steel. Uh, so this is sort of again a defensive measure uh, to make sure that whatever could happen of dangerous things, we keep everything inside the cocoon. And the cocoon is the pressure boundary. This is where we keep all the radioactive stuff in and keep all the airplanes and humans out. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then the fourth barrier is the building that it's inside. Right. The building is not supposed to be nuclear grade or be approved by the authorities. It's, it's just a regular building, warehouse type building. And it's just there to keep the weather and the birds out. And um, what would be the duration, the lifespan of your reactors? I mean, we're doing five years. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, the, the the total plant and the building and the cocoon and the salt and the heavy water, all of those things last for fifty years. Or in the beginning, we apply for fifty years to run the plant, but of course, it we can ask for extension, just like other nuclear power plants ask for extensions. You, you apply for five years. In the no, no, so we, we applied for 50 years for the yeah. whole uh, whole site and the whole building. Yes. Then the the reactor container, the one where we have the pumps and the heat exchangers and the reactor core and the electronics, that one we expect, we expect to replace every five years mm -hmm. because uh, there's a limited lifetime on heat exchangers and pumps and likely also you want to update the software and the electronics or sensors after five years because they... Uh, they get a lot of radiation, so they would get damaged. Um, so that is sort of our consumable. And we talked about the price. We expect that we can build uh, the, the first prototypes of that for five, six million euros. So it's not very expensive to build these reactors. Of course, that, that price doesn't include the salt and the heavy water. Right. Um, Okay, so the, the, what, what would be the next step then for you? Because yeah, you already have the testing facility of the water, I've seen mm -hmm. the one with the warm salt, the good heated salt, and the next one is it's now going very rapid, right? Yeah, so the next reactor that we're going to build a little bit later this year, mm -hmm. uh, it's the same as the one you saw out here, but it's going to be tested uh, with uh, uranium and thorium salts. So we, we won't make chain, chain reaction, and it's not an enriched uranium salt, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a natural uranium salt. Uh, so we cannot make a chain reaction. Also, we will not use heavy water, we just use regular water. But at least we have the exact chemistry that we will see in a real reactor. We have the same density because uranium and thorium salts are the right salts. Um, and, and in that one, we will also have the cocoon, this very heavy steel structure, the third barrier, because we also want to test that. Uh, and it, it's, it's expensive and it's also really big and heavy. Uh, so we look forward to start getting those components and start testing those. Um, and, and of course, so that's one really, really important milestone this year is to get that uh, reactor up and running with uh, or uranium and thorium salts. Uh, the, the, the other important milestone we already talked about is the lithium-7 yes. enrichment. We will, we will not start large scale production this year. Uh, the main purpose this year is to show that we can make the very high quality and then next year, 2025, we will start scaling up the production. 
of, of lithium seven. At least that's the plan. And and then with the uranium and thorium salts, that's going to go through your entire process again, from material testing to the small tests. Yeah. Those yeah, we, we already we have another location where we can test uranium and thorium salts in these um, test tubes you saw where there's it's not pump but it's just static. So we already do those tests of materials. Uh, but you're right. Later this year we will start pump uh, uranium and thorium salts through these loops, the test loops, so we can test heat exchangers and sensors and reheaters and yeah pumps and everything with with the real salts. Okay. And then the last question, when do you think we can expect the final reactor of the chain reaction to work? Yes, yeah, so the, the first time we start a reactor with a chain reaction, yeah. uh, it's going to be 2026. Okay. That's what we expect. And then we expect to have a commercial reactor in 2028. Mm. Um, okay, so by the end of this decade, we can see a few of these probably around the world already. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Well, Thomas, thank you very much for this uh, you're having a conversation for sure you the lab and everything and I really hope you guys all the best with this. Yeah, thank you and thanks for your visit. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.